the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the invitation to talk to you guys. Um, so today, um, I, I want to talk about some of the work we've done in emotion over over the decades. And I really want to I want to I'm going to start off by talking about some of the past work. But also what's happening currently in my lab, but also what the uh, the future foretells, basically. And I'm hoping to get all the way to the future because that's, in some sense, the stuff that's intriguing my my group the most, actually. But so I'll try to I'll try to uh, talk relatively quickly, but I'm not very good at talking quickly. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Um, so basically, okay. Giving to me. Yeah, interesting. It's not responding. Uh huh. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so I I basically am interested in computational models of human behavior, and th the reason is because I really don't understand human behavior until I computationally model it. Um, in some sense, I t I look at psychological theories, and they leave me kind of um, uh, leave me with lots of questions. So really, it's the modeling that actually helps me sort of get a sense of what's really going on. And so this, the work I've done over the years is real, you know, heavily involved in three areas. One is emotion and its relationship to cognition, which is what I'll talk about today, but also looking at social interaction um, in a particular theory of mind reasoning, as well as looking at the number of behavior we use in face-to-face -face interaction. Now, that's one aspect of me. I like to model human behavior. The other as aspect of me is I actually like building things. Um, and uh, since a very young child, I've liked building things. And so one area of application I've done a lot of work in is building virtual humans. And there, the role of emotion really is essentially is often tied to uh, using emotion to sort of um, convey, not only express the emotion of the virtual human, but also to influence the virtual human's behavior. So emotion models in a lot of the virtual human work I've done have been sort of a key element influencing how the virtual human quote unquote uh, thinks. Um, but more recently, I've been involved in these large scale simulations, in particular looking at things like, can we use models of emotion and cognition to predict whether or not people are going to evacuate during a hurricane. Um, and does that tell us something about how we can actually influence that decision? So, and then additionally, we've been looking at uh, pharmaceutical drug supply networks. So this is work where we're actually modeling how, how does the stress of a, a pharmaceutical shortage basically influence the decision makers? And so at the beginning of this talk, I'm going to be talking about the emotion modeling that's gone into virtual humans. Later on in the talk, I'll start talking about this work by Yang, Yang Satin Show on modeling uh, people's decision making during hurricanes. So my basic view is that there's a close connection between social psychology and social agents. My this view basically is that data and theory on human behavior that comes often from psychology helps us, provides the ingredients for us to formalize computational models. We then can take those models and integrate them into social agents. And one of the things, one of the benefits of the formalization is that you concretize the psychological theory. Um, one of the benefits of the integration is you now are working across psychological uh, uh, silos. So for instance, people in psychology may study emotion, they may study cogn cognition, they may study language, <clears throat> but there's not many people in psychology that think about the relationship between all those things. But when you build a social agent, you have to think about, well, how does emotion influence the dialogue? How does it influence uh, things like nonverbal behavior? And then once you have these social agents, you can put them in applications. But additionally, there's all these other benefits that accrue from doing this kind of process. So one is once you have the computational model, you can simulate things. You can make predictions and generate hypotheses, which you can later test with, test with human subjects. 
Once you have a social agent, you basically have stimuli and confederates for research. So people like Rachel Jack uses essentially virtual humans as stimuli to study emotion expression, expression of emotion. Um, and then once you have an application, you have the potential for data collection and analysis at scale, because you can throw out that application and see how do people respond. So I see this incredible synergy, both in terms of the flow of ideas, but in research methodology going on between uh, psychology and social agents. This is not a new idea. I mean, this goes back all the way to Herb Simon in Sciences of the Artificial, but I think it's an important idea. And it's an idea that's essentially driven my research over the years. Now, specifically looking at emotion, um, what I'm interested in is modeling all the kind of rich impact that emotion has on our behavior. So it, you know, emotion shapes our body. So it basically prepares our body to take action. So if, for instance, you know, it changes our blood flow to, so the blood may flow to the extremities so that we can take physical action, or it may uh, avoid flowing to the extremities in case there's a chance that the, uh, the, uh, there may be an injury and then you don't, you don't wanna bleed out. So it's actually manipulating things like our blood flow. It's mani manipulating our breathing patterns. To so oxygenate blood, <clears throat> it's obviously shaping cognition, <clears throat> interrupting yeah, interrupting some behaviors, influencing our goals and beliefs. <clears throat> it also, <clears throat> of course, shapes the minds of others. So, for instance, if we were interacting with this woman on the right there, we would be shaped by her expression. <laughs> Our interaction with her would be shaped by her expression of emotion. So there's this signaling and coordination that's going on through emotion. Now, I invariably like to show a video to demonstrate all these things. And I apologize to those of you who've seen this video before. I've been playing it for many years, <laughs> um, but I think it's a fascinating video. Um, in this video, um, we, I was actually working with a troop of actors looking at the nonverbal behavior they used. And we've been rehearsing all day. It was now night out. It was hot. The windows were open and a bird flew in the window. And so I want you to look at specifically this, uh, the actor in the center of the screen, um, how she reacts um, in this scenario. Okay, let's do it again. That was good. Um... You were very respectful, Sergeant, this time. Let me know. Turn on the light and we break it. Open the There it is. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. So let me just show you some of the complexity of just what just happened. Um, okay. Let's do it again. Uh -oh. That was good. So initially, she's just sitting there. The umbrella she has in her hands is a prop because she's playing a soldier in this scenario. So that's going to be her gun. And she basically first orients towards the stimulus. And you first see her eyebrows go up. I don't know if you can actually see it easily. You probably can't. You have to really be close to it to see it. Uh, her eyebrows go up as she sees the bird. Her mouth opens, her eyebrows go down. And then she starts to do a fight and flight combined response where she's trying to move away from the bird but she's preparing to potentially whack the bird with the umbrella. Um, and then she moves back and then she starts showing concern because the uh, bird is caught in the, the hair of uh, another actor. That whole scene, basically, uh, that whole scene from beginning to end, that whole video is a little over two seconds. Um, and you see this kind of rapid transformation of behavior from from uh, essentially a, um, a startle response, a surprise or startle response to uh, some sort of anxious kind of fear, fear response to an aggressive stance 
to compassion for others. And I think to some extent that sort of reveals um, the complexity of how people respond to these highly charged events. Um, one thing that, um, that Herb Simon argued in a classic article in 1967 is that emotion serves important functions for humans, that in particular, it's a fast, in interrupt, a resource-bounded cognitive and behavioral responses. And so it's, it's prioritizing things, it's interrupting, it's causing goal switching, um, which is critical uh, for the cognitive architecture. So it's an interrupt signal, essentially. But it's more than an interrupt signal. It's in some sense, what's going on in that bird scenario is particularly interesting because <clears throat> at one moment, the actress is thinking about the performance that she's about to do. The next moment, her whole attitude is thrown out. You know, essentially, it's no longer about the performance, it's dealing with this bird flying in the window. So there's sort of this swap out and swap in going in of the representation of the state of the world. And it's happening really fast. Um, it, it happens within a you know, couple of tenths of a second. And I'll go into greater detail of the timing issue in a, in later on in the talk. But more than that, it's potentially, it's speaking of the fact that these are kind of open world domains. It's not like you're optimizing behavior for some closed world. No, the behavior has to be optimized over open worlds where very unexpected things can happen. There's also these priming effects that are probably happening. Because the umbrella was supposed to be a gun, Maybe that helped her prime her to use it potentially as a, uh, a, a an instrument to whack the bird. Um, so there's really this in addition to this sort of complex um, interruption behavior and context shift. There's also the fact that these things are uh, encompasses encompassing both comparatively simple and complex cognitions. So there's sort of like oh, the threat of a flying bird, but then there's compassion for others that's coming in here in this kind of scenario. And so when you think about emotion, you can have emotions about things in the moment or things that, you know, long-term relationships. So in some sense, it's uh, emotion is associated not with some specific kind of event, but rather it's a general, a, a general phenomenon across different types of cog cognitions. And there's this integration of the cognitive, physical, and the social. So there's some, obviously some cognitive processes. There's some physical things going on. When she opens her mouth, she's probably sucking in oxygen to oxygenate blood, you know, or she's screaming, one of the two. I'm not sure, because I, I don't hear her screaming, but I'm not sure if she's actually sucking in oxygen or screaming. And then there's this social effect of like, you know, the fact that there's this signaling and coordination between people, one of the persons starts going to rescue the bird and other people start joining in. And I think for me, I think this tells us a lot about how do we actually build robust AI and, 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 it, and what optimality really means. That you can optimize for some closed world, but you have to be thinking in terms of these kind of open worlds if you're actually putting uh, AI in the real world. So, so looking at this question of how do we model these emotion processes, most computational models of emotion are really tied to appraisal theory. Um, that's, that's not uniformly true, but there's, it's still probably the dominant way of computationally modeling emotion. In particular, causal appraisal theories, where the idea is this, there's this appraisal process that is a subjective interpretation of a person's relationship to their environment. And that's leading to emotions and that's leading to certain kinds of uh, behavioral responses. Now, because appraisal theory very carefully lays out, or not very specifically lays out the nature of these appraisals, it actually fits well with sort of a BDI, belief, desire, and intention framework. So that's another reason it's really driven a lot of the computational modeling work. So let me just go over what appraisal theory is in case there's people in the audience that don't know it. Um, so basically, if you look at appraisal theory and specifically uh, Lazarus's appraisal theory, um, 
there's this notion of the relationship of the person to their environment. So the person has certain goals and beliefs and intentions in relationship to the, the environment, environmental situation they're embedded in. Now, the appraisal process basically appraises the environment in terms of how it impacts the individual's goals and intentions. Um, and that leads to an emotion. And what makes appraisal theory easy, relatively easy to computationally implement is this appraisal process is, off, is laid out in terms of these appraisal dimensions. So is the bird flying in the window desirable? Was it expected? Was it controllable? Who's to blame? So basically those, those kinds of appraisal dimensions lead to a certain pattern of appraisals to whether the event is desirable or expected or controllable or not. And that leads to different kinds of emotional responses. So if an undesirable event happens that's unexpected but controllable, that may lead uh, to anger. But if it's, uh, if it's not controllable, that, that'll lead to a fear response. So basically the pattern appraisals determine what kind of emotional response you have. And then in Lazarus's theory, there's some coping strategy associated with this. There's some way that the individual either tries to change the world, um, change the world, or change themselves, change their goals, beliefs, or intentions to fit the fit the world as they perceive it. Um, so the the distinction is whether it's problem focused in Lazarus' terminology, i.e., acting on the world, or emotion focused, acting on self. And if you break these categories down, the kinds of coping strategies Lazarus talks about is things like in affecting the world is like taking action, seeking some, seeking uh, instrumental support from others. But also um, on the emotion focused side, there can be things like resignation, giving up on some goal. So your friend is very sick. Um, you eventually realize the, 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 the disease is terminal. There's nothing you can do. So you give up. Uh, on the goal of trying to uh, get your friend healthy and you shift to other kinds of goals of making them feel better, for example. Distancing is a, uh, um, basically involved in sort of saying some goal is maybe not that important. M maybe it's not so important I become uh, a doctor. Maybe I can leave med, med school and do something else. Um, wishful thinking is to think is to think that you know well the world isn't uh, going to be as bad as I think as people think it's going to be things are going to get better so in the hurricane scenario people often engage in wishful thinking oh the hurricane's not going to be so bad I do not have to leave my house so so let me go back over those 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 that earlier slide I had we we're talking about this whole process of formalization. In the process of formalizing something like appraisal theory, we need to represent the person-environment relationship. We need to do some process for deriving appraisals, some mechanism for deriving appraisals. We need to derive the emotions and intensities from the appraisals, derive the behavioral and cognitive consequences, these coping strategies, and satisfy the process requirements and constraints. Um, in particular, the process requirements and constraints are quite exacting. So emotions can be fast or slow. They can have cap rapid or delayed onsets. They arise over past, present, or future events. They generalize over types of events in context, right? So it's not like you have different processes associated with bird flying in the window that you have with other kinds of uh, traumatic events. Um, Emotions relate to or integrate with other processes and behaviors. Um, and then there's this whole question of how do you model the interrupt? How do you do, get this swap out, swap in behavior I was talking about previously? And then this is specifically, how do you model the changes of goals and beliefs? In particular, what are the constraints on coping's effect on beliefs and goals? We don't arbitrarily change our beliefs to make ourselves feel better. There's some stickiness here, right? We're not going to we're not going to, you know, uh, transform. We're not going to you know, give up thinking the hurricane's not coming, but maybe we'll think the hurricane's not going to be that big an impact. So there's a constraint on what kind of belief changes we can actually uh, uh, realize in in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives. Um, 
So over the years, there have been a numerous computational models of this um, that come out of my group. Um, one is Carmen's Bright Ideas, which was uh, essentially looking at coping strategy as a user interface. Um, there's Emma that John Gratch and I created, um, which is really classical AI planning compared with uh, uh, basically connected to decision theory, theory representations. So decision theoretic reasoning within a classical AI planning architecture. Um, Thespian, which was really looking at appraisal as a byproduct of theory of mind reasoning. And then there's most recent work, uh, Constraints uh, CADM, which is uh, basically a system that looks at this whole question of can we, how do we model constraints on coping strategies? How do we model constraints that people can't arbitrarily change beliefs or goals? There, there's some stickiness here. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, Okay, what I'm checking, checking how bad I'm doing. <laughs> um, what I'm gonna try and do is I'm gonna talk about Emma, talk about CADM, and then I wanna talk about uh, GPT-4, <laughs> which is not on this list because it's a little bit more recent. So um, in particular, I wanna talk about different ways of evaluating these models. So one way we can do it is we can assess the model implications when integrated into an agent that can take actions, can have goals, et cetera. We can model real world scenarios in these things and see if they can effectively model a real world event. Uh, we can fit the model to survey data from real world events. So we uh, conduct uh, surveys of humans and see if we can fit the model to these surveys. And we can compare model predictions to human responses and controlled experiments. In the ones in italic are the ones I'm going to attempt to actually talk about. Okay. So the first model is the oldest. Um, it goes back, this is a relatively recent paper, 2014, only a decade old, um, but it actually goes back to 2005 probably. Um, and this is work by uh, John Gratch and me, basically on this particular model, which we used in virtual humans. And the basic idea uh, in this model is that we can represent the person environment relationship as a classical, within a classical AI planning architecture combined with decision, uh, decision theoretic reasoning. And essentially what this looked like was something like this. So there are past events, like for instance, some past act that caused, um, uh, caused by some other, that threatens our current goal. So be the bird flies in the window, it threatens the goal of staying healthy of the actor. Um, then there may be future actions like whacking the birds, which reestablishes the goal of the safety of the actor. Now, basically what's happening here is you have a classical kind of uh, threat and facilitate linkage that you have in a classical AI plan, but you also have this notion of utilities and probabilities associated with this. This is decision theoretic features uh, within this plan that are telling you about what's the overall utility of these goals, what's the uh, probability of, uh, for instance, achieving them, or what's the probability of a belief. And this allows you to do um, certain kinds of reasoning about what goals to pursue, for example. Now, the assumption is that that this plan is maintained by the perceptual planning and dialogue processes of the, of the virtual character, essentially. There's other cognitive processes that are maintaining this representation. And so that basically means that we can now embed this in an agent where it's perceiving the environment, it's doing inference and decision-making, and it's maintaining this person-environment relationship and working memory that stuck structure that I just showed, that, that essentially that planning structure I just showed. And the idea is that appraisal is no longer a process, but it's a feature detector. It really is um, these other processes like inference and perception that are maintaining this, this representation of, of the relationship of the person to their environment. And the appraisal process is just feature detection. It's looking at the features in that representation, deciding, hey, is this something desirable? So desirability is how much does the state impact an agent's utility? Likelihood is the likelihood of probability of a state. Expectedness is could the truth value of state be predicted, et cetera. 
So basically, the appraisals now would just feature detectives off of the causal interpretation being maintained by other kinds of perceptual and cognitive processes. So appraisal itself can be as fast as it needs to be because it's just reading off. It's these other processes that may slow it down or speed it up, depending on the nature of what that update is. And so the argument that's been made uh, many times over the years is that one interesting thing about appraisal theories and appraisal variable, these appraisal variables, is that they don't seem to be necessarily specific to emotion, right? I mean, you would want any social agent to think about the desirability of an event, uh, whether it's uh, what's the likelihood of a state of the world occurring, uh, how expected something is, because that's important for belief maintenance. Uh, controllability tells the agent, you know, well, do I have some action that actually alter the situation in some positive way? And if not, should I even, should I give up? Um, and then causal attribution, of course, you want any social agent to know who's causing them harm, basically. Now, coping gets a little bit more interesting because now we have this whole notion of not only problem-focused coping, which is standard planning notion of taking actions in the world, but we have this emotion-focused stuff that's basically saying, oh, you can alter the subjective utility of some, some goal. You can say this goal is not that important. So it can change its representations of, uh, of, of goals in terms of whether they're important or not. It can just give up the intention to achieve a desired goal. Uh, wishful thinking argues that essentially you can alter beliefs or the likelihood events. And avoidance is that you can take action that alters working memory. So all these kinds of um, emotion, uh, these coping strategies can be characterized as changes in desires, intentions, beliefs, and attention in a virtual agent's architecture in particular tied to those features that I, uh, those, those plan representation features I, I, I showed earlier where they're actually altering those features. They're altering the, you know, the utility of a goal, for example. And really this allows an agent now to seek an ecological niche. Unlike an agent who, you know, keeps on trying to pursue a goal, goal here now the agent can adjust its goals and uh, basically find what ecological niche it's, it can be most effective in. Now, the other thing I mentioned in that earlier slide is, is this whole process of integration. Now you're taking these models, you're taking saying this model of emotion, you're integrating it into an agent. So that provides concrete interpretations of appraisals and coping, which we just went through. It transformed appraisal from a process, which is how psychologists often talk about it, to basically feature detection. Um, and so the emotion now, this whole sort of theoretical quandary that you, happens in appraisal theory as to how can you cognition be fast is sort of um, sidestep because now it's appraisal process itself is pretty lightweight. It can react immediately. As soon as you perceive the bird, it can kind of react to it. Um, it also transforms coping into a generalized control mechanism to in influence other mental processes. So it's, it's altering the goals and, and the desires or goals of the agent, uh, what the beliefs are, et cetera. And the other thing that happens is this blurring of causality, because you have a cycle now, you have appraisal, then you have these coping responses and it ends up blurring the relationship causality. And I'm, let me illustrate some of that. Um, if you take Emma and you start putting it into models, like you simulate that bird example I just showed, you find that anger, you know, there's a distinction between how Emma models anger and how appraisal theories often talk about anger. So in standard appraisal theories and also in Emma, events appraised as undesirable, other blameworthy, blameworthy and controllable lead to anger. And so you feel anger and then you, you, you basically lead to the behavior. Anger can also arise from the intent or signal to achieve the control in Emma though. In Emma, anger can be the cause or effect of intent to whack the bird with the umbrella. So for instance, 
it can it, that aggressive stance we saw the uh, the actor uh, take in the picture on the right. That can be due to a, a feeling a feeling of fear, low control. The be, the intention to whack can lead to a sense of greater control, and then anger ensues. It's not like anger leads to to the whacking, but rather the whacking leads to anger as well. So the, there's a blurring of causality. There's also the fact that there that the feeling of the fear can be just the expression of anger through the whack posture is an attempt to assert control over the social interaction. And then once you assert control of the social action, you feel anger. So this blurring of what's causing what is happening because you have essentially this feedback loop between appraisal, coping, and coping responses. Um, there's also this interesting thing that we, we find in Emma is that you know in a standard kind of appraisal theory view of things, events appraised as undesirable to others, self blame blameworthy and self blameworthy lead to a sense of guilt. So if I've done something undesirable to somebody else, I feel guilty, and you cope by making amends, addressing the wrong. Emma also predicts just forming the intention to make amends can make Emma feel less guilty. And once Emma feels less guilty, that alters the likelihood or makes less pressing future action that makes actually does make amends. So just the agent essentially makes them feel better because they're thinking they're going to make amends, but they never, that reduces the likelihood that they will actually make amends, which is interesting, interesting byproduct of these kinds of, this, this kind of uh, feedback. And then there's a classic kind of guilt to anger uh, mechanism. Um, so guilt uh, in an appraisal theory view, guilt arises when events appraises undesirable to others and self blameworthy. Um, but Emma can cope with guilt by altering belief of who is blameworthy. So if they decide, oh, it wasn't really my fault, Emma feels better. But once Emma does that and shifts the blame to, uh, to another party, Emma is now mad at the other party. So it, it, there's this natural tendency in Emma to go from guilt to anger, which actually, again, happens in people. <laughs> um, so, so one thing we can do with these kinds of things is we can, a very simple thing to do in terms of evaluation of the model is to take a real world scenario like this, this bird scenario, which by the way happens and it's amazing how fast it happens. Um, but uh, we can take this bird scenario and see how it actually can be modeled inside of Emma and how the dynamics of those evolving states are a byproduct of the modeling, the model itself, both the model, but the model embedded in, in, in an overall system where there's inference and decision-making uh, and perception. So for instance, their dynamics, this dynamics is a product of dynamics in the world, the changing behavior of the bird or the distance from the bird to the person, uh, dynamics in the environment relationship in terms of inference and decision-making, like you know, raising the umbrella, uh, and then these various dynamics associated with the ongoing appraisal process leading to these coping responses that are influencing uh, things like uh, inference and decision making. So you get the, you, you get this sort of interesting dynamics, basically, as you embed the model into an agent where it's tied to perception in the real world, it's tied to decision making, and this and these coping responses are constantly altering things like goals and beliefs. Um, that's one kind of simple study, and that's uh, that's probably the 2009 paper. Um, there's another kind of study. How am I doing? How bad am I now? I'm 36 minutes in, right? So it's not too bad. You I can perfectly make it. fine. I can make it. 
I'm talking, I think I'm talking fast. I don't really know. I'm sort of seriously jet lagged. So <laughs> I think I'm talking fast, but I'm not sure. Um, evaluation unit with <laughs> subject studies. Um, okay, so I want to shift now to something which is a little bit more um, rigorous, let's say. Um, and this is really trying to evaluate these kinds of models using human subject studies. And here I want to shift focus to a different model of uh, this model called CADM, which is actually uh, developed, I don't know, 2020, 2021, 2022. This is the, what I'm going to talk about is from a 2022 paper. And it's really unlike Emma, Emma which was used in uh, virtual humans, CADM has been used in social large scale social simulations. Um, in, it essentially is attempting to in, uh, model decision making under a high degree of stress. In particular, it was developed to predict or understand or model how people cope in high stress situations. In particular, you have this case of, say, a hurricane. Uh, and you can evacuate, which has its positive and negatives. You can stay in your house, which has its positive and negatives. Um, but at the same time, people may perceive the threat of the hurricane in very different ways because there's a lot of uncertainty of hurricanes in terms of what their intensity will be when it gets to your area, whether or not it will get to your area. There's all this uncertainty associated with hurricanes. Um, so, in the face of that uncertainty, people may form very different beliefs. They may form the belief that the hurricane is going to miss my area entirely, or they may think it's going to hit my area. Um, and so they, they may actually adjust their beliefs to cope with the situation, in addition to this question of whether or not they decide to evacuate or stay. So on the left, you essentially you have problem-focused coping, and on the right, you have essentially emotion-focused coping. And the idea is, can we predict behavior and therefore better prepare emergency services? And can we better influence the behavior? So for instance, one of the problems with people is they often stay when they're told to evacuate and bad things happen. So CADM like AMA models appraisal and coping, but it really tries to address one of the uh, major limitations in AMA. Emma didn't put any constraints on emotion-focused coping. And, and, and that's just not, that's a sort of an obvious uh, missing element. We can't wish away any arbitrary belief, for example. We can't give up. We can't distance ourselves from critical goals like you know, staying alive. Um, and so we need some kind of way of constraining uh, changes to beliefs and desires if we're going to model these coping strategies. I don't know why it's underlining. Go away. Let me, let me skip this. But basically, what I'm only arguing in these two slides is that essentially uh, this notion of changing beliefs and desires does not necessarily fit into a standard uh, model of rationality. So the really to model coping, we need to address these constraints. Um, how malleable are can, is someone's goals, intentions, and beliefs? How malleable are they? And what is the nature of the constraints? So for instance, what the constraints on wishful thinking altering beliefs? Is it the strength? Can you take an empirical view, which is uh, the strength of evidence supporting the belief? Uh, determines uh, the, le the level of certainty uh, associated with the belief, determines uh, how easy it is to change it. Um, or maybe you take a coherentist view where you're saying the coherence or dissonance with other beliefs or other goals influences uh, belief. So if this belief coheres with other uh, beliefs I have, like I'm, uh, I'm a Democrat and I, ha I entertain other kinds of beliefs because I'm in the Democrat, I'm a Democrat, you know, my political orientation is Democrat. 
there's a whole network now of beliefs, and I can't arbitrarily necessarily change one if out influencing the other. And this causes them to be sticky. So this is sort of the coherence view of, of beliefs that you know people like uh, Paul Thagard have modeled. And then there's the constraints on distancing, resignation, altering goals, utility, and intention. So that may be tied to the strength or importance of the goal, its relationship to other goals, including one's own self-identity. Um, and so there's this question now, again, of the goal having a certain strength or looking at the malleability of goals in terms of its relationship to other goals. What Cadam did, um, I'm going to briefly show what Cadam argued. Um, basically, Cadam had an appraisal character uh, calculation it's very much tied to expected utility, not dissimilar from uh, what Emma did. Um, and it modeled both types of problem, uh, both, ty uh, both types of coping, both uh, problem directed as well as emotion directed coping as actions. And it had kind of a standard kind of, it has a kind of standard decision theoretic formulation. Where's the probability of certain actions changing the state? There's there's a reward associated with certain actions, uh, a utility associated with certain actions. So we have this element: probability of an outcome, reward, and utility associated with thing. But now we have both types of actions here, not just not just standard um, actions changing the world. But additionally. There's a cost uh, function here now. And the cost function is pretty simple. The difference between the initial belief and the new belief is scaled. The cost is this difference between the initial belief and the new belief scaled by the uncertainty or variance of the belief. So essentially, just to show you what that equation actually looks like, that cost breaks down to basically, uh, it's the mean of, of the, of the initial belief, because the beliefs are just a dist measure uh, model as a distribution with the with the desired a desired new belief that that assumes a certain distance. There's a certain difference there being calculated, and that's scaled by the uh, the variance. Now, now this works because in the example I'm about to show you, these beliefs are numeric. <laughs> so we can actually do this calculation, right? The, um, as we'll, we'll show, it's going to be things like depth of flooding, for example. So there's actually a numeric, numeric difference we can calculate. So, so now what this is telling us here is, is that any kind of decision, if we're just looking at emotion-focused coping, any kind of a be utility benefit from the emotion-focused coping has to be, uh, off, is offset by the cost of making that change in belief. So Academy has been evaluated in multiple ways. Uh, human subjects studies where we basically have pre and post surveys after real world hurricane events, and we do uh, various kinds of fitting uh, studies, ablating aspects of the model to see, uh, see what best fits the, uh, the data. What I'm going to briefly talk about, oh my God, what I'm going to briefly talk about is a human subject simulated hurricane experiment. We place subjects from a known hurricane area into a simulated event, uh, and then we evaluate CADAM's constraints on emotion directed coping. And so the experiment is two days before the hurricane, the subjects get a hurricane message, they report a belief. Um, we situate the subjects in a building. They're on the first or third floor, for example. Um, um, and they have to decide whether to stay or evacuate. One day before the hurricane, they get a new message, which that me message either strengthens or weakens the hurricane, and they report belief. And we're only looking at the subjects, and I'm only going to talk about the subjects who stay. So they can no longer, once they stay, one day before the hurricane, it's too late for them to do any other action. They can't evacuate because evacuation is no longer possible one day before the hurricane. So basically, they, all, they are forced to do a motion-focused coping this one day before the, uh, the, the hurricane hits. 
And so we're going to report what's the change in belief. And the conditions are the uncertainty of the message is it is the and they're getting these messages from the hurricane uh, the national hurricane center. So this standard kind of messages that this national hurricane center sends out and we associate those meth messages are is the degree of uncertainty whether or not the hurricane is going to hit their area and how strong it's going to be. And they're either situated on the first or third floor of the subjects and the hurricane in that hurricane message two either weakens or worsens. So we had 400 participants. Um, they received these realistic uh, National Hurricane Center warning messages, and the analysis focused on belief changes as those that stay. Okay, so two key hypotheses. For people who stay and the hurricane worsens, those who receive a high uncertainty message will believe the hurricane at the second time to be less severe, lower wind speed and flood depth, the nose receive a low uncertainty message. So from the perspective of the model, the higher uncertainty implies less cost associated for a particular belief change. The utility change is for people who stay and receive a high uncertain message that the hurricane worsens, those who live on the first floor will be, believe flood depth will be lower, higher negative uh, utility, high negative. Not sure what I'm saying here. This doesn't make any sense. It be flood depth would be lower, and which should be uh, flood depth lower is a lower negative utility, and full instantly would be higher would be a high negative utility. This slide seems to be wrong compared to those who live on the third floor. So this assumes the first floor residency will lead people to believe they will be impacted more by flooding. So so it should have a bigger impact on them. And third floor residents would be impacted more by hurricane winds because presumably on the third floor, the hurricane winds are, more, are, are a greater risk. And what we find, the results show for all but one condition, people who stayed, stayed believe the flood depth and wind speed to be lower than the message, which is the dotted line. The message is the dotted line, um, which is that, and also lower than those who evacuated. So basically, if people who stay believe the flood depth and winds we do lower, so they're they're basically adjusting their beliefs, so um, to cause less anxiety. When the hurricane weakens, less of a threat, we don't see a significant change in beliefs, though, which suggests that people use emotion-focused coping in this experiment, unless, of course there's no need to do any emotion focused coping because the hurricane weakened, right? And so, oh, I should have done that. So these are all the significant results. And these, the one, when there's high uncertainty and, and the hurricane weakened, category two here, and hurricane weakened, we don't get the effect. And again, because you don't have to do emotion focused coping if, if a category two hurricane is not much of a threat. Next, there's um, results for the uncertainty hypothesis one and the utility hypothesis two. We see that those who presented, let me see if these things, um, those, um, those who, who were presented hurricane messages with high uncertainty believe the hurricane be less severe than those who see low uncertainty information. It supports hypothesis one. So there's lower cost, essentially, of shifting, shifting the uh, belief because of the uncertainty. In the utility case, those who are situated in the third, plot, third floor apartment believe the hurricane wind will be lower than those who are situated in the first floor. But interesting, there's no clear difference in belief about flood depth. And that may be because most people don't think the flood is the major problem. In reality, they are scared of the wind, but not the flooding, but the reverse is actually true. What kills people is the flooding. Um, so that may mean that people are just not worried um, about the flooding. 
Okay, so I think I've run over. Can I can I briefly say something about GPT four? Uh, you haven't run over. Just go on. Oh, go on. Okay. Um, okay. So, so this is all this modeling stuff, right? And 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 increasingly, I've been interested in modeling things, not so much virtual humans, but real world impact. <laughs> <laughs> like this is this modeling of of uh, hurricane evacuation is part of a larger effort to improve our responses to hurricanes. This is a larger project this is part of. My students and I have recently become very enamored, <laughs> or or in case of some of my students, frightened by GPT four. <laughs> um, um, and so what. We've been studying GPT-4 in multiple ways. We've been looking at it from, for instance, modeling theory of mind processes, modeling un appraisal dimensions. This is just something I did recently because I was kind of intrigued by it. I wanted to see how GPT-4 would respond to that birds uh, video <laughs> I just showed you. So, so I prompted it. I said, I gave it a prompt. Actors were rehearsing a scene. You know, they've been rehearsing for a while. Uh, one of the actors is uh, one of the actors was using an umbrella. Um, all of a sudden, the bird flew in the window, hit the window, and tried to fly, made, uh, fly back out. It made a loud noise. How did the uh, Sally react to the noise? Well, so GPT four initially startled by the loud noise, instinctively gripped her umbe umbrella tight and looked around around to identify the source of the sound. That essentially is what happened. She basically was drawn to the sound. Um, and she was initially startled. Um, I then took it the next step. The bird continues to fly through now towards the actor, actress. How did Sally react then? It, it turned to a mix of, her reaction turned to a mix of surprise and mild panic. She instinctively, instinctively raised the umbrella using, <laughs> now she, you, using it as a makeshift shield to just say herself and the incoming bird. Of course, she, the uh, GPT-4 is thinking the umbrella is kind of like, it keeps out rain. So he's thinking it more of a shield. She used it more like a bat, you know, like a bat. Um, but um, but it's, 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 it's putting the umbrella into the mix. So then I, I next step four, the, the actress quickly moved away from the bird and now was on the other side of the room. Meanwhile, the bird was caught in the hair of another actor. Um, how, did, how did Sally react then? Upon seeing the bird caught in her fellow actors here, Sally's concern for both the actor and the bird intensifies. She quickly crossed the room to assist, urging the actor to remain calm and not to hurt the, hurt, the, uh, hurt the bird in the process. That's when she started to move forward. You may remember she had her palm up and she was sort of, she was personally relieved, but she had her palm up because she, she was beginning to worry about the uh, bird. So that fits the video pretty closely. Um, the bird was now free of the actors here. Uh, a third actor was now trying to rescue the bird. How did it react to this new development? She realized that the bird actor's attempts to catch a bird may be further stressing it out. In fact, that's what was happening. I didn't actually show, uh, talk about this in the video, is he was trying to, the, uh, the person, the, the, the man that was go running across the screen, uh, was actually trying to grab the bird and get it safely out the window. But that was freaking the bird out, this guy approaching it. And then it goes on to say that she proposed that they turn off the lights in the room. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's, it's a little, it's, it's amusing, frankly. Um, so that's just me doing sequentially. Then I decided, okay, let's do it all in one fell swoop. So I gave it the, all one sequence and said and figured and asked it how things um, and I basically this time asked it about its uh, the actor's facial expressions. So it says it showed surpri surprise, eyes wide open, eyebrows raised, which is true. You guys couldn't see it. The mouth slightly agape uh, also happens, not not slightly later, I think actually. Um, as the bird continued to fly in the window. And towards her, Sally's ex facial expression turned to one of fear and anxiety. <laughs> her eyes widened even more, eyebrows furrowed, and life tightened in a worried grimace. 
Um, upon seeing the bird caught in the hair of another actor, an actor hitting the bird trying to get out, Sally's facial expression shift to a mix of concern and empathy, or eyes soften, blah, blah, blah. So it's coming up with the right emotion response and, and a reasonable facial expression. Except here at the end, she's showing relief and hope because actually what happened was the, the, the actor trying to rescue the bird was freaking it out. So it was, wasn't going well initially. But so that's GPT-4. So that leads me to a, a few comments. <laughs> um, so one thing I wanna say is I, I think if we're actually gonna to try to model and predict people's behavior, especially in these kinds of high stress situations like hurricanes, we really need to worry about emotions, but also coping responses in particular. Um, I also think that the role that, I go back to Herb Simon, I think the role that emotion plays in human behavior and human decision-making um, is a critical function. It's not that we necessarily have to give our agents emotion, but we have to satisfy this interrupt function. We have to come up with something which allows more robust behavior in open environments, essentially. Um, this appraisal and coping cycle um, affect a range of cognitive processes and behavior. And what, furthermore, when you once you put this into a cycle where you have the appraisal process, coping responses, altering uh, both uh, actions the agent takes, but also internal uh, beliefs and desires, you get this complex sequences of unfolding responses that you see in real life, I think. You see these kinds of unfolding going on in real life. Um, however, those there are some significant challenges. Um, we need to be able to sort of model this swap in, swap out behavior, swap out, swap in behavior, um, which is we often sort of build models that are, are well contained uh, they're not, they essentially have an implicit closed world assumption. Um, we also have to worry about constraints on emotions impact, the constraints on these belief changes, these desires that Cadam was trying to tackle in one way. But I think there's multiple ways to actually tackle this. And I think a lot has to be explored there. And then the question, obvious question is, do we need the model at all? Uh, we just have large language models, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and one thing that worries me about that is, as I said, we're doing a lot of work exploring LLMs, but one thing that worries me goes back to the slide I showed earlier, that all these benefits between psychology and agent researches were tied to having explicit representations of the model. In, in what's happening with LLMs is we, we kind of lose sight of what the model is. It's embedded in this black box. And so I don't, many of these benefits don't actually happen. These notions of concretizing psychological theories, for example, or seeing how different theories integrate with each other. It's all kind of hidden away in this black box. And so this kind of slide that I often show, if I if I go completely to LLMs, I can't show this slide anymore. <laughs> is my is my concern. Uh, but also, I think there's this sort of intellectual transfer between psychology and, and computer science that I think is lost. We end up being in a space where we're psychologically analyzing LLMs, um, which is you know instead of like using psychological theories to understand people, we're modeling psychological phenomena. Now we have two things we're trying to study, the black box of the human, the black box of the LLM. Anyways, all right, enough, enough said. I think I, I think I may have actually not gone over. I don't really know. <laughs>